the title of my presentation today is How to Escape from a Cytotoxicity Failure. It has three important words in the title. Cytotoxicity, failure, and escape. Now for today, I want to really focus on the escape part. And I thought of, of it as playing a little game, the following game, an escape room. Does anybody know an escape room? Yes. So to explain it very simply, today we're locked inside of this room and we need to get out of it. So when you're locked in an escape room, you have more or less 60 minutes to get out of the room based on team building, based on knowledge, and you have to crack codes one by one in the right order. It's very important to get it out of the room. Now, the second word is cytotoxicity. It's very important. Why are we performing a cytotoxicity test? For each medical device, uh, you have to demonstrate that it's biocompatibility, that it's safe for use through ISO 10993-1, biological safety evaluation through a risk assessment. And one of the endpoints is the cytotoxicity test, where you demonstrate whether your device has potential cytotoxic effect on cells. It is an important part and it's always done through testing. It's a cheap test, it's a fast test, so everybody does it. So you do it for your submission, as I told you. Some of our customers also use it as a quality control check in the manufacturing production, just to see whether their system is under control. And you can also use this test to select some raw materials in designing your device, whether or not you have selected the right materials. If we then look at a mystery, what do we need? So normally this is the ideal scenario. You have your medical device, you extract it, you expose the extract to the cells, and you see happy cells, green light pass, the cells are alive. Today's mystery in the room is very simple. You have your medical device, you have a device extraction, exposure of the extracts, and the cells are dead. Black dots, a fail, and this often causes a panic at our manufacturers, at the sponsor side. Why? because they believe this will stop their submission. There is something wrong. Now, ISO 10993-5, which describes the cytotox test, says, yes, indeed, there is a potential cytotoxic concern. You have to investigate it, but that does not mean that your device is unsuitable for its intended use. You need some further investigation. It's just a warning sign, okay? So this is our mystery. This is how our room in the laboratory looks like, but for today, the room looks like this. So visualize it, this is our room where we need to find clues. Here I've hidden six clues, six steps to escape, and together we're going to find out where we can see some clues in the room. Not sure if anybody sees a hint, something, think about detectives. Look at the floor, yeah. Indeed, the footsteps. So you see, first clue, we have found it. Now we're going to look what is step one in your investigation is the confirmation of your laboratory results. You have to make sure that the results you have obtained, are they valid, right? Is the testing done according to the procedure? How is the lab accredited for the testing? ISO 17025 gives you a good idea. Is the, the staff trained? Are there unexpired products used? Is the testing done how I want it, which controls are used, which conditions has been done for the extraction. All things you should ask yourself and you should challenge your lab. Now, the lab managers, and I'm one of them, they don't like this investigation because of course, if you, uh, let's say, give a result out, everything should be according to the procedures. But you, it's, it's always worth to ask, were there particles observed in your extract? Did the pH change? Something could have occurred or something could have gone wrong. So I would always ask, check it. The accreditation gives you some guarantees that the controls are in place and it is an important first step. If you can invalidate the laboratory results, that means you can retest. If that's a path, it's the easiest way to get out of this room today. Your assessment is complete and you can continue. You can only invalidate a laboratory result based on actual proof and evidence, not on a hypothesis, not of I think that the lab did a mistake. It is a collaboration with the lab, but it's a first step. What happens if you cannot find a laboratory error? You have to dig deeper. So we're going back to our escape room and we're going to look for the second clue. So I'll give you some time to look for a clue. The DNA on the couch is indeed the 
correct second clue. What are you going to look at in this particular case? You're going to see, okay, I've done my test. I've selected some extraction condition, it failed, but were the extraction conditions suitable for my device? For instance, the exposure of the extraction time, ISO 10993 says 24 hours or 72 hours. For instance, you have a device with a short-term exposure and you have done the extraction time of 72 hours, that's way too long. So you can easily reduce it to 24 hours. If you go below 24 hours, this is not standard. You can go below just up to four hours, that's the minimum amount, but you need justification. You need to have a failing result with 24 or 72 hours if you want to go below the 24 hours. You really need to justify, hey, my device is only a few seconds in contact with the patient, 24 hours is way too extreme for this extraction. Other important conditions or parameters are the extraction ratio. The ratio is described in the part 12 of the ISO standard and gives you six square centimeters, three square centimeters per milliliter or a, a weight per, uh, per volume ratio. It could have been that you've selected six square centimeters per milliliter, but your device has a thickness above one milliliter, so you're going again to worst case, you can reduce that. What you also can look at the extraction solvent. Normally you use the MEM solution. It both, has both polar and non-polar uh, properties and it's preferred. But if for instance you have a syringe which only comes in contact with an equation solution, you could actually choose for a, only a polar uh, extraction solution like 0.9% so sodium chlorides. So that is an option. Again, that needs justification. The third one is a sample preparation. If you have your device and you have extracted it, perhaps you have completely submerged it, or you tested some parts which doesn't come in contact with the patient. They're irrelevant for the test, but you have included them, and it's, again, perhaps worst case, or you only need to test the inner part or only the outer part, and you have done it or asked the laboratory to do it in another way. The sterilization method. How did it, was it sterilized? Was it EO sterilized? Was it steam sterilized? Was it representative for my application? Uh, consider that. In addition to this, you should also look at your historical data. How did I do this in the past? What ratio, what conditions did I use? Perhaps you can learn something there. And if you have data, historical data, you can also see, okay, what method did I use? Because for the cytotoc tests, there are quantitative and qualitative tests. So perhaps historically you did another test, another type of cytotox test, and now you did a new, you selected another one. That can be the reason why it fails, because the quantitative XTT method is, for instance, much more sensitive than the qualitative. But as a take-home method, I would say don't just switch the method. Knowing that the quantitative is more sensitive, going for the qualitative could be considered as testing in compliance. So don't really just change it and have that as a justification, you, you cannot do that because it is a warning sign, something is wrong. But let's assume uh, we have our second step. We said, okay, the original extraction conditions were not okay. We're going to retest them with the right extraction conditions. Now, really suitable for my device. If you have a pass, we're not completely out of the room yet. You have to go through step six, and that is actually a biological evaluation or, or risk assessment. You have to assess the risk of that device and you have to create a kind of passport for your device to get out of the room. What is this risk assessment? In, it includes the device use, the in vivo and other in vitro testing. It also looks at historical data and you look at your material or chemical information. You look at your investigation results and of course, if you change your parameters, you really have to justify why you can change it if you're deviating from the standard amount. So this way we get out the second phase. Of course, that does not always help. If we are now here and we say, okay, what we have done at the first place was actually what is needed for our device. Okay, how can we get out? So we need to dig deeper and look for a third clue. That's perhaps another, so keep that other, I will not, it has to be the third one. No, the, no. the third clue is right here, blood. 
blood in the canvas. Now you need to look deeper into your materials. You have to get to know, okay, I have a failure, it's no laboratory error, the conditions are okay, what is my material made of? Are there components in my material that have a known cytotoxic effect, like uh, DHP or natural rubber latex or some metals like silver? They are known to have a cytotoxic effect and that can be the reason. Or if your device is coated with drug products, of course, they can interact with the cells and cause a cell death. So, you really have to get to know your device, get your supplier information, look at your raw materials, because perhaps you can find the answer there. When you're doing this and you have some potential, uh, let's say, suspects for the cytotoxic failure, you have two options. The first option is to test your device without the cytotoxic component. This is not always possible. Is technically, but if you can do it, you can test your device without a cytotoxic component. If you then have a pause, you see, okay, it really the root cause of the original fail is indeed this component. Through a biological risk assessment, you can also get out of the room. Why? If you know which is the component, you know the concentration, perhaps you need some additional data on the kinetic release of this component, you can justify why it is safe for use together with all other data. If you cannot remove the cytotoxic component out of the device, there is also another option. You test the device, you do the extraction, and then you expose different dilutions of the extract to the cells, and you see at which dilution you actually have happy cells, live cells. For instance, one, the fourth dilution, that's just an example. In parallel, you, uh, you also test a predicate device which has the same build of the same materials and you which has also known cytotoxic uh, result and you test it in parallel to see if it's comparative. This device is already on the market together with the results that you have. You can add that to, you, to your risk assessment and you can justify why it is safe to put on the market. So it is clear if you want to get out after step three and you have found your root cause that you, of course, always need your passport to get out. I think it's a very important message that you get the passport out of the room and you are free. If that doesn't work, then we have to dig deeper. You have to look deeper and we have to look for the fourth clue, which I already heard today, so we can perhaps see. Indeed, the fingerprint right in the back. Let's look at that. That's the fourth clue. What you're now going to do is really assess, okay, have I seen historical cytotox failure for this device, this material? What have I learned from that? And if you don't have any answers there, you can look, okay, has there been a change in my process, my manufacturing process? You can look at your suppliers. Did they change anything in their uh, production? Did they add some molecules? Did they do another change? What, if, what have I changed in my process? Am I using different techniques? Am I using different products? What products are there that I have used or are new and can cause a potential cytotoxic effect? Package, did I change the packaging material? It can have an effect. And some of the devices or where we see a cytotoxic failure is where at the production site, the manipulation of the devices is now done with gloves of latex. It's a very sensitive test, it's just handling the device and put it in a package with latex gloves can actually be the cause of a cytotoxic failure. So you can look at the assessment, find the root cause in your manufacturing process, and if you have found it, again, you can prove that. Perhaps you have to justify why it's okay, have to change some things in your manufacturing process or ask your supplier to undo the change that they did or rechange re your products again, and to get out, the same story again, you need to say, okay, I had a fail, I've made some alterations, now with my passport, with my biological risk assessment, I can actually uh, get out. Let's find now the next clue, the fifth one, because we're not done yet, there's a fifth one. So we're back in our escape room and we're looking, okay, we have found the foot fingerprints, we have some, found some blood stains, the fifth clue is hidden as well here in the room. On the chair, indeed, with very good eyes, you can see there is a little wire there. That's our fifth clue. 
this is the part where you're going to do some investigational testing because you have no suspect for, based on your materials, you have no changes not, noticed in, in your production, your suppliers. So what you're going to do is you're going to test different lots of your medical device. Perhaps your failure in Cytotox was only linked to one lot. You're going to challenge at different phases of your manufacturing process to see, okay, where does the failure occur? Where do I see the shift from pass to fail? At this point, it's very difficult, but you, so you test everything and you evaluate where you see the shift. Hopefully, you can find something and then again, you know how to get out. But this is really where it's now more difficult to say, okay, what you need to do, because here you have a lot of data and then you need to compare step by step. Okay, here I see a change. This might be the root cause and you can dig deeper. So from step five, investigational testing, you have escaped, you get your passport, you justify why. The last clue for today, Indeed, data on the laptop is this what always is done in investigational data on computers, mobile phone. At this moment, you have done investigational testing. You have looked at all your components. You have done everything possible. There is only one option left, and that is only see, okay, can I create a passport for my device? Okay, I have a failure, but based on my device use, based on in vitro and in vivo results, which are, of course, then passing, because if they're all also failing, then we're in a different story. Based on the risk and based on chemistry results, you can really create a passport. And you get that approved with a biocompatibility expert, with a toxicologist, a material expert, and that is your way to get out. So as a conclusion for today, we all entered this escape room voluntarily. We have solved the mystery of a failing cytotox test. Normally at your side or at our sponsor's side is often a panic. Now, the next time you're dealing with this situation, don't panic You say, oh, I can play a game with my colleagues, perhaps with some experts. You can follow this path. You know what to do. You know exactly which steps you do. You can obtain your passport. If you, of course, cannot remember this from, from today's presentation, you can also read every step in this approach in our white paper, which you can download from our website, of course, and it's written, and I really want to thank my colleagues, Audrey and Kathleen, to write this document, because so far, a lot of sponsors are actually using it and, and calling us and saying, hey, I'm at step four, can you now please help us? So we speak the same language. You have done some homework, we know how we can help you, so it really uh, adds uh, value for you and as well for us. And with this, I really like to thank you for playing the games with me that we escaped. And if there are any other questions, you can, of course, email me or ask it now. Thank you. <laughs>